Trace Lane Recording is a specialized tracing technique that just maintains execution data representing only the most recent program activities. The trace light recorder in Go is nothing really new. However, it was in an experimental state and is now officially released with Go 1.25. Therefore, in this video, we will quickly check out this new trace light recorder and its capabilities. But before we do this, let's just first clarify what even is tracing. Tracing is just a technique for monitoring and debugging applications by really collecting detailed information about a program's execution. This information or data can can really include, for example, function calls, go routine activity, timing data, and memory allocations. Tracing really helps developers to kind of understand how their programs behave at runtime, which in the end just enables them to identify performance bottlenecks and really debug complex issues. Unlike traditional tracing techniques that really capture everything from start to finish and potentially generate massive files, flight recording is just a tracing technique that maintains the execution data in a circular buffer, which really represents only the most recent program activity. So to put it simply, it automatically discards all the information to save space and reduce processing overhead. And this in the end just produces a much smaller trace by capturing only the traces that really matter. So let's just take a look at the code here. Okay, let's just create a simple web server here by just using http.handlefunk and then we use the pattern just slash so the root path basically and then we're going to say handler and then we are going to pass in a flight recorder in a minute then we're going to just say log fatal and then we're going to say http listen and serve and here we are going to define the port so 8080 and then we say nil in here. So this just overall really registers our handler function to respond to all requests in the end. And then it also starts the HTTP server on the port 8080. And this really blocks until the server stops. And you can obviously optimize this and let the server shut down gracefully. Okay, let's just create this handler here. So we say func handler. And this handler function returns an HTTP dot handler func, which in the end is really just this function here. So func with a response writer and a pointer to a request. And then in here we do return this anonymous function. So we say func and then HTTP response writer and then the request here as well. And then in here, let's just say that we want to spawn two go routines and we want to simulate some heavy work. So let's just create a function here, which we will call heavy load. And this heavy load function takes in a weight group, which is a pointer to a weight group. And then we also have an iterations integer here. Now again, this function just simulates a CPU heavy operation that we want to basically trace. And because we are actually spawning this function in a Go routine, we kind of have to keep track of when basically this function finishes or the Go routine finishes. And we are doing this with the wake group. So we're going to say defer and then wg.done. Here we are just telling the wake group that this Go routine really has finished. And then in the end, we are just going to say time.sleep and then 500 millisecond to just simulate some extra additional work. And then also before that, we are going to range over the iterations here. So here we just create a basic for loop, which just runs from zero to iterations minus one. And then we're going to say underscore equals to FMT dot sprint F. And in here we are going to say processing percent D and then we use I here. Now here we are just formatting a simple string to really create CPU work because string formatting or string operations in general is relatively expensive. The underscore in this case just discards the result since we don't really actually need the string. So here it just really simulates some string processing that might happen in your application as well. Okay, let's just get back to the handler and then we are going to spawn these go routines. So we're going to say go heavy load Obviously we have to create the wake group here. So we say var wg sync dot wake group. And then we're going to say wg dot add two because we want to spawn two go routines, which basically simulate two heavy load functions. And then in here, we're going to pass in the wake group. And for now we are just saying 100,000 iterations for the first go routine. And then for the second go routine, we just use, for example, a heavier load operation, for example, 10 million iterations. So the first go routine here is just really some lighter work. And then the second go routine is just a lot of heavy work 
for the CPU. Okay, cool. Then in the end, obviously we have to say wg.wait to really wait until both go routines really call wg.done. And this is clearly a blocking operation. Now again, I have to say that this is just an example. So we are going to just simulate some work here, right? And we want to actually see some tracing data so obviously I cannot really go into a production system and show it to you there. And then let's just imagine that we want to measure the time it took to kind of execute these two Go routines. And then we kind of want to respond with this time. So let's just implement this here. So we're going to say start and then we're going to say time dot now. Now this just records the current time so we can actually measure how long our work takes. Right. And then in the end, we are just going to say difference and then time dot since start and then we are going to send the response back to the request so by just saying fmt.fprintf we're going to define the http response writer here as the io writer and then we're going to say worked four percent f seconds and then we're going to say difference dot seconds so far we didn't really apply a trace flight recorder here but let's just change this now for that we are going to go back to our main function and let's just configure our trace flight recorder and we can actually do this by using trace and then we say flight recorder config now if we take a look at this struct we literally have two struct fields the min h and the max bytes so let's just define two values here so we're going to say min h and then five times time dot second and then we can also define the max bytes here and we are going to say three left shifted by 20. All right, so what does these two struct fields really mean here? So in the end, it is just some configuration that for instance, for the min age, it just keeps the trace events for at least five seconds. And then the max bytes struct field just defines the maximum buffer size to be three megabytes in this case. Now these two struct fields just configure the trace flight recorder and really min age and max bytes does not really guarantee data preservation in this case for the exact time and size we specify here. Really in the end, they just provide more of a recommendation to the runtime instead. Remember, it is important that the trace flight recorder is not really storing a continuous recording here, right? So we only want to achieve a snapshot of the latest trace. So the resulting trace file just contains the recent history up to that moment. And the history is obviously kept by the min age or the max bytes config values here. Also, it's important to note that the min age and max bytes do not really work in conjunction. So really what we are saying here, we are defining a good window for the recent performance data here, which is in this case five seconds. However, we also define the maximum buffer size. But it is important to know that if we look at the documentation, the age setting will always be overridden by the max bytes. So really it is a decision that you have to make between the min age and the max bytes struct field or config values. Okay, but let's just create this flight recorder by just saying trace dot new flight recorder. And then we're going to pass in the config here. And then we're going to start the trace flight recorder by saying fr and then start. And if there is an error, we are obviously going to say log dot fatal f. And here we're going to say unable to start trace flight recorder. All right, and then last but not least, don't forget to always stop your trace flight recorder by just saying defer fr and then stop. And clearly it is not really writing to any kind of file or snapshotting any kind of data to a file. But we can change this by just passing in the flight recorder to the handler function here. And then in the handler function, we are just going to say fr and then trace.flight recorder. And then we can use this trace flight recorder. So let's just create a quick utility function here, which we will call write trace and this again just takes an a flight recorder here and can return in the end an error as well now with this write trace function we just want to save the flight recorder data to a file for later analysis so what we can do first is just check whether it is enabled or not so if it is not enabled we just want to return an error so we say return fmt.errorf and then we're going to say flight recorder is not enabled then we are going to create a file so we are using the os.create functionality here and we're going to say trace.out. Then if there is an error while creating this file, we just return it. So fmt.errorf failed to create trace file and we use %w here. 
and then always clean up your resources by just saying file.close. Now let me quickly explain what's going on here. So here we are just creating a new file with os.create and this will override existing files. You can clearly optimize this by adding a timestamp here or even let the developer decide through a function parameter what the name of the file should be. I've used percent %w here as a verb because it wraps the original error and then in the end we are going to say fr.write2 and here we are going to use the file and then we are going to return the error here. Let's just fix this error here because the error is already defined. And this write to function just writes all the collected trace data from the flight recorder to our file. In this case, the underscore really discards the number of bytes written, which we actually don't need. But you might wonder what is actually going on in the background here of this write to function. So here it is important to note that it obviously does not write everything to a trace file, it just takes a snapshot of the circular buffer's current content and respects the configuration with the min age and max bytes limits. Then it kind of forces a buffer to flush to get the most up-to-date data, which in the end should not be stale data. And importantly, it writes atomically. Therefore, write to can only be executed one at a time. All right, let's just use this write trace function inside of our handler function. And what we're going to do first is we are going to define a sync.once. So we say trace written and then sync.once. Now sync.once just really ensures that our trace writing code runs exactly once. And then in here we can just use the difference really. So we say if difference is greater than 300 milliseconds, then we can say trace written dot do and let's just create this function here. And this if branch really just serves as a performance trigger here. Now we define here what the application considers a slow request. And if our work took longer than 300 milliseconds, we want to save the trace snapshot. Now there are many alternative ways to implement this performance trigger, like having a percentile based threshold, for instance. Also, you could implement this as a middleware as well. But I'm going to keep it really simple here. This do function really is part of the sync.once functionality and again it just ensures this only happens once even if multiple slow requests occur here. And then what we're going to say is we are going to say if error and here we are going to use the white trace function and we are going to pass in the flight recorder here. And if the error is not equal to nil we are just going to return and then log printf and then failed to write to trace and then error. Right, really, really simple. So whenever we kind of hit this performance trigger, we are going to save a snapshot of our trace to the file, which we've called trace.out. Okay, now with that in mind, we can just run this application. So let's just say go run main.go. And now it actually started. So let's open a new terminal here. And then we can curl this localhost 8080. And what we are going to see is that it took 1.2 seconds. Okay, that's pretty cool. Now, how can we actually analyze this data? Because if we're going to check here, we now have a trace.out file. What we can simply use is just the trace tool to really analyze the trace file. And this trace tool is obviously just a tool for viewing trace files. And with that command, we are going to view the trace inside our web browser. Now there are good UIs that you can actually use to read this trace data, but I'm going to simplify things and I'm just going to use the trace tool in this case. So what we can say is just go tool and then trace and then trace.out. So trace.out is just a path to our file. All right, and then we have a lot of information here. Now let's just have a look at our trace file and the information we've actually collected. Let's just have a look at the GoRoutine analysis here. So let's click on it. And then we can actually see that we do have two heavy load GoRoutines here. We can clearly see that other Go routines exist as well, but the main functionality is really inside of our heavy load Go routine. And here we can actually see the count and the total execution time. Let's just click on one start location here. And then right over here, we do have the Go routines listed with the ID 42 and 41. And then we basically have a time breakdown here. And I'm not going to go into depth here because there's much more detailed information that we can use. So let's just go back and then let's just have a look at the view trace by proc. Okay, so this looks kind of funky here, but what is actually going on? Let's just zoom in and then I'm going to quickly explain what we are actually seeing here. 
So we are going to see the stats here of our trays, which basically consists of the go routines, the total heap usage and the OS threads in use. Now these procs rows basically mean that each row represents work executed on a logical processor. And the red vertical ticks in this case are just scheduler events and the purple blocks are running go routines. We can see noticeable patterns here, such as the heap line climbing and then stepping down. Now this is due to the allocations from the sprint f function, which in the end just grows the heap and then the GC cycles or the garbage collector cycles cause the step like stabilization or drops in this case. So the short GC cycles really reclaim the recently allocated strings and that's why we actually see the growth and then the drop as well. We can also see that the work really happens on multiple procs simultaneously, which just confirms that our code is taking advantage of multiple cores. And this is a perfect example of the MN scheduling algorithm of the Go scheduler. We can also see that the Go routine just jumps between procs, which is also expected due to the nature of the work stealing scheduler. We could certainly delve deeper into this, but that should be enough for the investigation of this trace. Okay, and now you might actually wonder when is this actually useful? So when should I use trace flight recording? It is useful for production debugging, which can be helpful for you to capture the context around rare errors without continuous overhead. It can also help you with performance monitoring to really analyze performance issues that occur unpredictably. And if you have a memory constrained environment, this trace flight recording functionality is just ideal because it really keeps the trace overhead minimal while maintaining observability. All right, and that is everything you need to know, at least for now, about the new trace flight recorder in Go. If you also want to see other features that have been released with Go 1.25, feel free to check out this video here. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely day and bye bye.